Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Empowering Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm Glenn Harper. Julie Smith. I am not able to speak today. What's up with that? Well, I think it's because you know what you have to say. If we just let you speak off the cuff, you do a lot better. That is a true statement. Well, we've got a really good guest today. Uh, let me read a little bio here. I'd like to introduce you, Allison Fodbork, an author, publicist, attorney, teacher, and way back, she was an oil wildcatter, which means drilling for oil in uncharted areas, taking risks in uncharted territories, hoping for significant discoveries and a pursuit that combines geologic knowledge, intuition, and audacity. That pretty much sums up her journey. I know you weren't a wildcatter, but I thought the name, because you were in the oil and gas industry, I thought was a good You to go said to. that, and I was like, oh, wow, this is going to be, she's been all over. Well, oil industry is bad, right? right? <laughs> but I think that definition probably describes your journey pretty well. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. Quite the trapeze artist of, of jobs. Huh? Yes. Yes. Our passion today is to promotion her Alley Cat Children's Book Series that teaches kids real life issues. And at the same time, she's a co-owner of a marketing firm that focuses on authors. The inspiration that she's able to bring to the kids in the classroom is what drives her to get up every day and be her best. Thanks, Allison, for being on our show. Thank you so much for having me on. I feel like we have to go back because even <laughs> I, I don't even remember all the things that you've done. We're going to have to really dissect oh, that. Oh, we'll get into those for <laughs> sure. Um we, uh, you know, we like to get to know our guests first, a little bit who they are as a person first, and then we get into the journey and such, and it's kind of fun. And it, and I think you grew up in uh, Youngsville, Louisiana. Is that true? A small town west of Baton Rouge? Uh, yeah. So Youngsville, Milton, Lafayette area. Gotcha. Is that a big, big town, little town or? So I grew up in a, in a small town where everybody knew everybody. My parents had a small pharmacy. So we I pretty much grew up in a drugstore. Um, after school, we would come and, and hang out in the pharmacy. And I remember playing um, hide and seek with the different that's in the days where they would put drugs out in the aisles, you know, like like amoxicillin and stuff. And so, um, you know, just thinking about my childhood, it's like, well, yeah, there was me and my three brothers and sisters um, saying, okay, first one who can find the amoxicillin wins, you know, and that's not normal. <laughs> so, Was it a similar to like, it's a wonderful life, the drugstore that George mm -hmm. Bedley worked at? Did you have a soda fountain and all those kind of things in there too? Or is it just strictly a drugstore? Oh, yes. It had um, one of those Coke um, and Pepsi machines that were really awesome. school with the bottle cap opener and, um, not a vending machine, but just a rack of like chips and M and M's that you could buy. Back when the when life was simpler, was it not? Oh. It was simple. It was so fun. I end. don't. I don't know what happened. You know, it's uh, funny. We talk to people all around the country, all in the world, and uh, it never ceases to amaze me that how Louisiana is its own ecosystem. Like they have their own set of laws, they have their own set of things. It's just totally different than the rest of the country. Fact and. Uh, did you ever want to leave Louisiana? Or did you, I assume you live there now. Did or did you uh, like just like I like how this rolls here? I understand it. You wanted to stay. Yeah, I like Louisiana. I still live here. Um, I love to travel. I love to see the big cities. I love to see you know the mountains in Wyoming. But um, by exploring those different areas, I realize how how great Louisiana is. You know, the people are so, so nice. Everyone's family, the food is so good. Um, and it's just a slower paced life here. So this is a burning question that I've always had, and I've heard it described many ways, but what is the difference between Cajun and Creole? So I guess if you're talking about food, like so um, a Creole gumbo will have tomatoes and stuff in it. And, a, you know, a Cajun gumbo will have um, a traditional roux. Um, but, you know, I don't really know the exact difference. I just know that I like Cajun food better than Creole food. And also the the people that live there, I think there's two a couple different uh, you know, demographics of people like the, the Creole folks. And I don't, I, and I remember hearing it some time ago, it's different tribes migrated there. Do you, do you have any in, insight on what that would look like? I, I mean, do you know the difference or heard of it or? I've heard of it. I don't know it um, that well, you know, my, so my mom, she is um, from New York. She's a Ukrainian from New York and came down here to go to college. And my dad um, is from Baton Rouge area and he's an Italian. So um, we're oh. not typically 
Cajun or Creole. I'm I'm half Ukrainian, half Italian, so I'm kind of a little firecracker, I guess. Well, I suspect in Louisiana's case, they probably accept everybody down there, right? So they're very, as a very friendly society, like you said, we nothing but good things about Louisiana. Been there once, it was awesome. Well, I feel bad for her. She had no idea she was going to have to recite some of this history and know all well, these things. Like, I'm, I have some empathy for her right well, now. I didn't want to put her on the spot, but I was like genuinely but you curious. Did. Well, I didn't mean to apologize. I just was genuinely I'm always curious. honest. So you can yeah, ask was, me. I'll let you know if I don't know the answer. Right. I was genuinely curious because I'm like, I've heard of these things. Like, oh, maybe somebody will know. Yeah. Um, you know, how did you choose, uh, you know, when you grew up, did you, were your parents at the pharmacy? So they're basically entrepreneurs and you got to watch that struggle and do that. Did your mom work in the place as well? Or did she have her own thing? She did. She did. So they both um, worked there. And um, at the time, I believe Eckerd's, if you remember Eckerd's mm -hmm. drugstore, um, bought them out. And so then my dad became a state inspector for pharmacies. My mom went on to work at pharmacies in nursing homes and stuff. So they kind of grew from there. So I guess that just reflecting on that, I did get to see them start a business and then grow from there um, and expand. Were they more of a just sell the stuff off the shelf or they more of a compounding pharmacy where they make the own concoction for people? So they sold off the shelf. And then my mom actually worked for a compounding pharmacy at one point too, which was really cool. I got to see the behind the scenes of compounding, which is, you know, incredible to see. Right. Who knew they could, somebody could build something that a mega corporate couldn't build. Isn't that bizarre? It was always bizarre to me on that. Um, I just keep thinking in this pharmacy, if I was her, I would sign up for the job of inventory of the snack thing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like I would, as a kid, I would have been like, that's, that's my role. Lots of shrinkage in the, in the, in the candy aisle. I don't get it. No. Yeah, we, we ate all the candy. I mean, I was typically, I was good at math. So I was the one that counted the pills. I mean, that's, that's horrible to say on, you know, on a podcast, oh. but counted the pills. Um, so we had like this little tray and at the end it would go into this little slot that would go into mm -hmm. the it would dispense it and so you just you know one two three so hopefully i mean i was probably you know 10 hopefully everybody got their, the right number of pills i uh, there's no complaints today we didn't no. we didn't get any when we googled you so you're all good no pending okay. lawsuits i think you did you did a great job uh, how did you decide to, when you wanted to go off to school, how did you decide uh, what you wanted to be when you grew up? And I guess it was a uh, university of Louisiana is a bachelor of arts uh, degree. And then at some point you decided to become a, a, a an attorney. Uh, is that what you always wanted to be as a teacher first, then the attorney was later, or how did you decide on what you wanted to be? Well, I guess, I guess my honest answer is that I didn't know what I wanted to be. Um, I thought I was going to be a pharmacist. And then I realized that I didn't like to see the things in the medical field, you know, needles and all that kind of stuff wasn't my thing. And so I really didn't know. And then um, Legally Blonde came out the movie and I really liked the show. And I was like, you know, she can do it. I can do it. So I ended up getting a little dog named Bruiser. You did this, not. I did. That's awesome. I that did. is awesome. Well, my now husband got me the dog um, and I made him watch the show and I told him for my birthday, I want a dog. I want to name it Bruiser and I want to go to law school. Um, and I was serious. And and so he got me a toy fox terrier. It wasn't a chihuahua. And so, I mean, I had to love the dog. I named it Bruiser. It, was, it wasn't like the best dog, but so I ended up getting a dog named Bruiser and um, decided I was going to go off to law school. And so I... Um, I decided to teach school for a year and get a, a degree in elementary education because you can go to law school with any degree. And most people mm -hmm. don't understand that, that you, you know, you can, you can go with any, any major. And so I figured if it doesn't work out in law school, I can always teach. And so I decided to teach one year and then, you know, kind of raise some money and, and go off to law school. And I, that's what I did. And um, I am so glad I did. And I practiced law for almost eight years as an assistant attorney general for the state of Louisiana. Um, so I still love Legally Blonde. And Great show. Oh, well, she's awesome. Did you, uh, when you came out of law school, did you, you know, I don't say most of the time, but I guess the people, the clients that I see, they always want to go work for a firm, hang up their own shingle and be uh, against the government. How did you decide you want to be on the government side? Is that something you learned, you decided to do in college or afterwards? Is it just a great opportunity? 
So my dad's first cousin was the attorney general, um, Charlie. Oh. And so um, I actually interned there and was a law clerk while I was in law school in Baton Rouge. And so, um, and that was during hurricane Katrina. So that was a bit of a mess. It was, it was wild. CNN was there all the time and I got to really see the inner workings of government. And so I, um, you know, from Lafayette and I wanted to work at the satellite office once I uh, graduated law school. And so I did. So I worked um, in Lafayette as an assistant attorney general and handled uh, med mal, state defense, uh, represented DOTD, the, you know, the roads and um, the schools and I really enjoyed it. That is amazing that you could get right into there. But when you have a connection, I mean, now you're in the inner workings, you're on the inside, you probably got to see a lot more than the average person, which means you probably learned a lot really, really fast. I did. I did. And I actually was, um, I got to help rewrite the emergency handbook, which should have been rewritten <laughs> 50 years ago before Katrina. Um, so I was happy to be a part of that and hopefully help going forward so that that wouldn't happen again. As you reflect back, was there anything like, you know, obviously there was the pharmacy and then anything between pharmacy and college, getting your teaching degree to law that would have, you're like, hey, if I would have known that doing that, now I understand why I did this type of scenario. Obviously the attorney general being, you know, in the family, but is there anything else that really ignited that passion? To practice law, I um, I always love to write. Um, I could write for days. I like to read. I, um, I wanted to be able to do something that made a difference. I just, I didn't want to just stand still. And so all the pieces kind of fit together of what I felt my personality was. It's just not to be um, stagnant and and do something. And I love to write. There's a lot of writing and trial briefs. And um, mm. now I'm just writing children's books. So. I, so in high school, did you write a lot of things that went against the grain that, you you know, maybe you changed the, Julie the handbook likes the there? <laughs> Julie likes the controversial content. Well, no, I just think that's probably always been ingrained yep. in her. And, you know, she loved to write and she loved to do that. I can't imagine that growing up that that wasn't still very apparent, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so we had this class called Whole Language. It was like a trial for our eighth grade class. And all we did was listen to, not all we did, but what we did was we listened to Inya and we would just free write. And everybody was just writing their to-do list or writing about their dog. And I'm sitting there writing poetry and I'm writing short, you know, stories and things about Louisiana and um, really just loved it. And I really got into that. And um, I I was always different, I think, than a lot of people. I do have a twin sister. So that's a part of it, too, where I'm always trying to be different and be my own person. You know, in in, in sixth grade, when everybody's wearing all of those, you know, bright fluorescent puff paint shoes, and I'm wearing like black Adidas, I decided to go to school with black and and I mean I thought that was cool and I looked probably ridiculous but I just I had this feeling of I don't want to just be a part of the mainstream I don't want to just follow suit I want to be different and be seen so you're the one in ballet class wearing the Batman outfit you mm -hmm. had to be <laughs> which is <laughs> yep you're the different which is which is great because again you just uh a lot of people probably don't recognize that they're they don't want to conform. They want to be something different. And I think the sooner you recognize that, I think that the sooner you can develop and, and tap into that to that creative juices that you had. How did you pick uh, University of Louisiana versus LSU? A lot of honest answers, huh? Yes. So, um, We're my, in trust. It's okay. My twin sister was going to LSU and I wanted to be Allison. And so that was a part of it. I, it wasn't against her. I just wanted to be my own person and not be the twin. You know, we were, our, my maiden name is Foti and I didn't want to be the Foti twin. So I went to a different school just solely for that reason. Awesome. <laughs> that, that totally makes sense. So can I ask, what did your, what did your twin sister do? She's a nurse. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're working for the attorney general 
putting criminals behind bars, do, preparing briefs, doing all the good stuff. And all of a sudden, way in day, you're like, you know what? I think I want to write children's books. Mm-hmm. How did how did this happen? So at the time, um, we started, I say we, it was more of my husband's, um, but I'm going to kind of help, uh, started an oil field uh, company that bought and sold oil field equipment. And at the time he was really busy starting up a new business and I was really business preparing for trials. And our, our kids were six and four at the time. And I just felt like we were just never present. We were, but not as much as I wanted to be. So, um, I always had this inner fire to do something different. Um, although I love practicing law, I just felt like there was something more to do. And I decided to take a temporary retirement to be at home with them. And we, um, he kept, you know, building the business. And one night we're reading bedtime stories to our children and they want more books for the bookshelf that's already overflowing. And I was trying to be frugal. And I just said, look, I'll just write you a story for tomorrow night. I'm not going to go buy another book. We can save money. And um, they were so excited that I offered to do that. So I felt accountable. I felt like I had to do it. So I ended up going downstairs after telling them goodnight, writing the first Alley Cat story. Um, and they loved it. And I loved it. And I love seeing their faces and, and how happy it made them. And I used resources and tools and lesson base. So they kind of got a, you know, a sense of uh, problem solving within. And I submitted it for about a year while I was on my temporary retirement. And right before I was about to go back to practice law, I got picked up by a publisher. So when you go, and and again, that's awesome. But I'm like, how do you just go, oh, I'm going to write a book tonight. Like, how did you know that you were going to get in the theme of the the life lessons and the story? Like most parents to be like, see Bob with the carrot or, you know, whatever. How, How did you know to go into that genre and be able to come up with that overnight? So I, I I really didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know I had any kind of talent for writing or creating or have an imagination, um, although I always love to write. So when I sat down and just started writing and I wrote about a cat because um, we love cats, we love dogs, but cats are unpredictable. They always get into some kind of problem and they have to kind of solve it and they're, they're funny. And um, so I started writing about a cat and I wrote about maybe like an issue that my kids had. Um, they felt left out that week at school because they had a milk protein allergy and they had ice cream day and so they couldn't partake in it. So I said, you know, what? let me write about that. And it just, it just came out on paper and that's what I do. I just sit down and take, you know, about an hour or two and it just, it just comes out on paper and, and I don't know how, and uh, they seem to like it. So I'll keep doing it, I guess. You're a good mom. That's that's impressive. Yeah, I don't that, know that I could sit down and write it. That is that is really cool. So once you, st- did, how long did it take you to write that book? Was it an overnight thing, or did it take a few days, a week, or because the kids uh, were waiting for you the next morning? Well, and I would realize what did you write it on? Like, were there pictures? Did you draw stick figure pictures, or what? <laughs> what did it look like in its first version? Um, it was on a loose leaf piece of paper and with a pencil and just wrote, I have terrible hair, handwriting and I just wrote it. And it, originally it was Alley Cat Strikes Back. I have no idea. I just came up with that title, but the story had nothing to do with striking back. Um, and so it was just a handwritten uh, piece of paper. And I wrote it within that night. It took me, I don't know, an hour and a half. I left the ending blank. I knew how I wanted it to end, but I left it blank because I wanted them to fill in the ending and they did, but their endings were kind of wild and crazy. So I kind of tamed it down. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm just, my draw is hitting the floor. Cause it's just, that is such a, that seems like it would be so hard for an average person to come up with the creative content overnight and to think it all through like that after you read the kids, the story and they were all into it, probably they were moms of the hero. Is that when the light bulb went off and said, you know what? I can write this all day long. Is that how you did it? Probably had to go write another one the next night. Well, that's what I mean. That's what I'm guessing, right? That was my aha moment is when they loved the story and they paid attention and they had all these endings and they were so happy. And I love seeing them happy. I love seeing children just light up. And um, I didn't, write another story what I did was I started researching researching how to get an agent how to get a publisher um end up writing a query letter and so just kind of fine-tuning that manuscript 
and figure out what to do with that next. Like, what's the next step? And so that's, I spent the next six months researching on how to get an agent and a publisher. So you knew this is one, a story for your kids. You thought it was going to be big right away, or you wanted it to be big. I wanted it to be big when I saw their reaction. And then I saw what a challenge it is to get a story published. I mean, everybody can publish a book on Amazon these days, but to actually get with a traditional publisher is super hard. I, I, I've gotten over 500 rejection letters from agents um, over the years. Um, and now I am with a traditional publisher, but I saw how hard it was. And for me, that was a great challenge. I wanted to do it and I wanted to accomplish it. So did your kids get to watch you kind of go through this? Did they get to watch that process of mommy wrote this book, mommy read us this book. Now mommy wants to share it with all the other kids. Like, did they get to watch that or did you kind of keep it from them? Oh, no, I involved them and and they get to see the rejection letters. I read it to them. I read the bad reviews that I get sometimes to them. I want them to, I don't want to cushion their falls. I want them to be resilient. And as teenagers now, it's super hard because they have, you know, heartbreak and they have, you know, big things that happen. I want them to be resilient. So I, they were a part of everything. Whenever it was time to do the illustration descriptions and describe what the characters were wearing, I involved them. I wanted them to see how to build something small into something bigger. And I guess reflecting now, it's probably what my parents did, uh, you know, with their business. You know, it's funny is uh, you didn't realize at the time, or maybe you did, but the uh, kids at that age, they're your harshest critic because they'll tell you straight up. They have no filter. And they're so, so you, truthful. Right. So you knew when they said like, you're like, oh, look what I got here. Because they would not, they couldn't even think to just not tell mom something because it might hurt her feelings. They're just going to tell you, which is kind of cool. They will tell you. And yeah. so I, I appreciate that because, you know, they will tell me if I'm wearing something ugly, you know, they'll tell me if my story sucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got to get them on payroll, uh, do some income shifting. No, that's good. Now, how many, um, when you say this series, um, I didn't have a chance to delve too deep in it, but how many books are in this series that you have? So I have seven that are published. I have one that's in um, illustration and graphic design right now. So it'll be released next year. And then I wrote um, a Christmas Alley Cat book, which will be released in 2026. Is this for these books for a specific age group or demographic, or is it can be anywhere from whatever age that could be? It's for ages about three to nine. There's a lot of picture books because I love picture books and that would be good for me. Yeah. You have to add him into your yeah, demographic. I, I'm yeah, some good lessons. yeah. They're yeah. picture books so, oh, and they're, and they're all hardcover. So they're durable. I'll, I'll have to send you some. Oh, we'll have to go online and get some. That'd be, that'd be great. So now you're publishing your own book and you're like, you know what? Wait, did you go back to the attorney general or when you got that, was that a sign that that's not what you should be doing? So when, when I got that, it was a sign that this was the path I was supposed to go on. So I said, well, you know what? I mean, I still have a law degree. I still have a law license. I can keep that up forever and I go back whenever, but right now is the time to do this. So I ended up, um, just publishing books. And I was um, hybrid published, which is very different from traditional publishing. So it's where um, you actually upfront the cost for printing. The whole goal is to get traditionally published where the publisher is paying for it all. And so um, it was a struggle because I wanted these published. So um, for four books in the series, four years, I would write a story and query agents and publishers trying to get picked up, but still knew that my hybrid publisher would publish the story if they liked the manuscript. And so finally, after book four, going into book five, I queried the agents. I got hundreds of rejections and I finally got a traditional publisher to pick me up. And so they actually picked up the entire series and and now still writing for them. So it was five years in the making of trying to get to that goal, which was really tough. So, so you could. Meanwhile, your, your husband's still building his oil business, right? Right. Right. 
So the the traditional is they fr- they pick up the cost to publish it the way you were doing it by default. You could get your book published. You just had to front everything, and you're trying to get to where they would front it and kind of manage that whole process, right? Right. So there's three different types of publishing. There's self-published, what anyone can do. They just upload it on Amazon Direct Publishing. There's hybrid, where you have a publisher who does a great job, but you're paying for the printing of those books, which you own them then. So you can still sell them. You're paying wholesale. And then there's traditional, where you're not upfronting anything. They actually will pay you in advance. So when you were in hybrid, how did you navigate how to sell the books that you owned? How did you get it out there? So I ended up getting my inventory. And so you you buy it. It's when you buy it from your publisher, you're buying it wholesale so that you can turn around and resale. Um, so I did author visits for years at schools. I've visited um, probably over 3,000 schools across the U.S. What? For like 50,000 kids. Um, it's so funny because like random kids will, you know, be like, oh, there's Miss Allison, you know, and and my husband's like shaking his head like, how do you know all these kids? Like, because I've seen so many over the years. And so the author visits were the best way to get my books out there. And they're, they're in bookstores and and stuff like that too. How, how do you go, being a mom with small kids, how do you travel to 3,000 schools in a short amount of time promoting the book? How, how do you navigate the logistics of that? I'm curious as all get out. So, it, yeah, it takes a, a lot of planning and um, I try to schedule it around my kids and, and my husband's, you know, work and stuff. And so what we'll do is we'll go on a book tour. So from here, Louisiana, all the way to Florida and make stops along the way um, and then take a summer vacation or we, we went to Disney at the same time. So along our vacations, I'm actually going to s- bookstores and uh, school visits. Um, my son is a an avid golfer since he was three years old. And so he plays all over the U.S. now. And so we would go up to Pinehurst, North, North Carolina and play. And so as he's doing that, I'm like popping into bookstores or I'm going to an author visit. And so it's just like this juggling of making all the schedules work. The entrepreneurial dream is to merge the personal and professional together and create some great tax strategies and participate fully in the tax code while at the same time, everybody's happy, right? You're doing your thing. The kids are doing their thing. Your husband's doing their thing. Check, check, check. So that was the hybrid. So where are you today with the real publisher? They've picked up all the books. What are you, what are you doing in your free time? Still visiting schools and doing all of that? Or what, what does your day look like? I'm still visiting schools and doing author visits, but I also co-own a a PR firm called Expound Publicity. And so we, my business partner, Lori Erlinski, and I, we help authors market their books. And so we started this during the pandemic when we had to kind of shift everything to virtual visits, virtual marketing. And so uh, she and I were working together with our own books to try to keep up that, that hype. And we got one client who came to us and said, can you help me with mine? And so from that one client in 2020 is now, I think we've had over 500 clients that we've helped market their book. So now um, that's what my daily life is. And then at night, I'm trying to, you know, schedule my book, my own book stuff. <laughs> so you're more busy than you were before. Fantastic. <laughs> Typical yeah. entrepreneur. Yeah. Love it. When yeah. you help market their book, does that mean helping them find publishers in the three avenues or helping them self-market their own book? And uh, So we're helping them with publicity and marketing. Um, they already have publishers or have okay. self-published. And so we have customized campaigns of things that they can do. Uh, actually, we kind of do it for them. So we facilitate the outreaches to the news, the bookstores, award submissions, and virtual book tours for them. So like your book tour you're just duplicating that and showing them the shortcut, how to do it. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so we kind of do it for them because a lot of our authors have uh, day jobs or children. And so we're facilitating the whole thing for them where they just have to kind of show up. And most creative thinking people do not have any business side to them. And most business people don't have a creative side to them. So it's cool that you can augment the two together. 
I mean, she has a teaching degree, a oh, lot. Well, she's the, the I mean, anomaly. She's got it she's all. A, she's an anomaly, but most like accountants have no creativity when it comes to writing a book. I, I could do that if I wanted to. And, and well, no one could read your handwriting, but that's yeah. just true. And that's the thing. You said you had bad handwriting. I find that hard to believe. Is it true? You speak, your mind thinks faster than you can write. Yeah. Maybe yeah. that's my problem. It, that's it, why my handwriting yeah. is so bad. I, just, I, I, I read know. fast. I read fast. I write fast. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I skip you over. have a creative there. side. You yeah. know, I, I am so excited for this podcast because my, I have to go speak to one of my kids' school about what do you do, right? It's like everybody gets to come in and I now I can be like, I got to to talk to this author and I'm going to take your book in and I'm going to donate to the classroom. So thank you for inspiring me for what that looks like. Absolutely. That's awesome. I love it. So so here we are doing what you do and you're busier as ever. Are you, uh, you know, you're going to continue down this path? Is there another thing you want to start up? Because those entrepreneurs, you know, they're all over the place and what they want to do and how they do it because there's opportunity everywhere. Uh, for you, it looks like you kind of perfected the, you being the writer and publishing, you've perfected the opportunity to help others do this. What's the next step? So I'm going to continue with the Alley Cat series, but I do want to write a novel. I want to write um, like a, a YA novel um, or something, you know, in a different genre. I um, I talk to my business partner, Lori, all the time about maybe start marketing products as well or marketing people, you know. So, um, yeah, sky's the limit, I guess. I've got a great idea. You can write a novel based on a, you know, a bizarre middle-aged white guy that does uh, accounting. Oh, that would be, that would be a very big seller. Would, very it big. It would be riveting. Very big. riveting. <laughs> I'll add some drama to it. Yeah. Oh, there's lots of drama in there. So do you plan to scale your marketing firm and PR firm? Like, do you plan to build a team and grow that? Is that something, you know, that is in the future? Yeah. So, um, We've grown a lot. We do, we've hired two people, which Lori and I are very type A. We like to do things ourselves, uh, but we realize that we have grown so much as a firm um, that we can't do everything. So we have hired some people and um, we want to grow. We're just not sure where just yet, but we know that the opportunity will present itself when it's ready. I mean, it's going to be your kids will wake up one day and tell you to do something. You guys will do it and it'll be a rising success again. I, I just have this feeling. So do you see anything in your children that, I mean, obviously, I, I think I love your story about your parents and their pharmacy. And obviously that kind of shed through into your children and what you've done and how you've raised them. Do you see anything in your kids that you're like, ah, I could I see that as me as a child or as a teenager growing up and, you know, you see some of those tendencies Yes, my daughter is is just like me, and she just wants to stand out from the pack. And it's not it's not the whole look at me aspect. It's more like I just don't want to be, you know, going the straight line like everybody else. And so, nonconformist. Yeah. 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 And so, um, I do see them being a little more like me now, where. They want to do something that's fulfilling for them. They want to do something that makes them happy as a career. My son wants to be a professional golfer and we're supportive of him um, and we'll help him anyway. My daughter wants to own her own business. Uh, now, what that's going to be, I have no idea. It's probably going to be like making cupcakes, but, you know, we'll we'll support her. Um, but yeah, I see that in them and I I love it because I don't know if it was just us in the eighties, how we were raised, but it just seemed like you had to either be a teacher or a nurse. And there was, it was kind of streamlined. There was no opportunity to say, Hey, I want to just be an entrepreneur. I want to, you know, be in marketing or write books. That wasn't really on those personality career quizzes. I definitely think you taught your kids to dream big and that they could follow their dreams, though. I mean, I think that's your personality, right? Just to listen to your journey. So kudos to you, mom, for being able to to give that to them. Thank you. Did you have uh, a mentor or somebody that said, hey, you know, Allison, you, you can do this. Um, and here, let me be your cheerleader and help you do this and give you that support. Did you have anybody that helped you through that process? Well, besides my children, who <laughs> at six and four, you, you know, you just kind of take it for a grain of salt sometimes. And but you know, my my husband is very supportive of things that I want to do. He may not verbally say, 
you know, yeah, you can do this, but he's always there. If, if I have a book sign here, if I want to go here, he, you know, he'll come and help me and, and never complains. And so um, I would say he's probably my biggest cheerleader or supporter. Um, just people cheer differently. Mm -hmm. Do you have, when you do this, um, do your book tours and stuff, is there like, is it, I don't want to say easy because it's probably hard to get into the schools and do your thing. Is it something where, you know, could you get into like the major book publishers that supply the books for all the schools that you could get into them and have them distribute so you don't necessarily have to go visit 12,000 schools? You can go the one to many instead of going one to one. Is that something that's on the horizon? I, I hope so. So in the publishing industry, there's the big five publishers. And so they kind of own that space. And I'm not with the big five. I mean, that that is every author's dream. But then it does come with, you know, losing some of that creative um, control. Um, I am not with Scholastic, which does a lot of the book fair. So I have to really work to get my books in stores. I Mm -hmm. will offer to come do story times. I will come do signings and then they'll, they'll purchase my books for the show. So it's, it's a lot of work. You know, it's, um, uh, this is going to be a random thought that comes in my head, but I have a lot of these. So, you know, when you look at a creative person that they have their skill set to do what they do, like a, a musician or whatever, they got to go on stage, sing the same song to a different audience and got to bring the same energy for you. You're reading the same book. 100 billion times, it would seem that every time you get in front of a classroom, though, the excitement in the kid's eyes makes it seem like the first time every time. Is that is that true? It's very true. It is very true. And so um, I treat the author visits like a almost like like a show you're going to. Mm -hmm. um, so when I go there, uh, there's songs with the Alley Cat series on YouTube and um on iMusic and there's a dance we have now have an alley cat shuffle and so um there are all these things that we do well I say we it's me and um there's a giant mascot that comes that the teachers will dress up in the the mascot costume and make it just very you know eventful for these kids and um when I go out there we start with the alley cat shuffle because you know in here in Louisiana everything's like a line dance you know mm -hmm. So uh, we do that and um, I read the book, but it's, it's very interactive and um, it's just so fun to go out there and they, they get so excited. They already know who I am and who, who Alley Cat is before I go out there. And that's, that was the goal. And so it just makes it just. So how, how do they know you if you've not been to the school? Does the school already have the book and you're just promoting it? Or how do how do the students that might, how do they know that you're coming that it's such an event? Is that something you tell the teachers to promote it? Or do you just got, you just got the following out there and they just can't wait for you to show up because you're the rock star? So um, here in Louisiana, I've, I've been to so many schools that I, now I'm just going back. So they have already know the characters and they know the stories. It's just with a new book. Uh, but in other states, um, I will send the book, coloring sheets, activity sheets, all the video trailers, book trailers and songs and stuff prior to. And so the teachers are really great about showing it to the kids uh, beforehand. And um, so that's probably what it is. It's a, it's a combination of both. I, I'm just sitting here with them again. I, how do you create all of these things? It's not just the book. It's all the stuff around it. Where do you find the time to do this? Do you outsource that or is that all you? No, it's all me. I'm kind of a wow. control freak. Um, I just want it to be fun. I want it to be exciting. I want kids to just, you know, go to school and I want them to read, but I want them to have fun reading. You know, my books are about having fun. Like we're not going to just streamline these, you know, these books into this lesson that is boring. Like we're going to have fun with it. And um, I don't know. It just keeps evolving. That's wow. fantastic. So it would, you want to ask the, the S question? Yeah. I, you're I'm, dying. To I am. It. So tell me, what is your superpower? Mm. Um, I think my superpower is being empathetic. And so I really, um, 
when when somebody is having a bad day, I really feel for them. And and you know, in my head, I start going through all these things. Like, what would what do they need from me right now? Not what would I need. Like, what would they need? And and so I do feel that in every situation um, with my clients. You know, what do they need uh, with the kids in the school? And so I think because I do a lot of self evaluation, and I am very. I'm really hard on myself. I don't give myself enough grace. And so I, I do evaluate myself and I, I have to tell myself that like that, that is a, a superpower is being able to be empathetic and, and be that person that someone might need that day. And then I have one last question, but what is your end game? <laughs> <laughs> My end game is for, um, tons of people to recognize the characters in my book and to love them and read them at night at bedtime. Like my kids were asking for a story. I want kids to ask for alley cat stories. I want there to be a Saturday morning cartoon one day that has alley cat. And so that is my selfish in game. Not selfish. You're just dreaming. But I mean, I love that because there really is no end game for you. It is just how many people can you touch in your lifetime with what you've created? And I think, you know, that's infinite. So keep doing what you're doing. It seems like that empathy uh, is such a good thing because when you walk into a school, you see these kids, you don't know what they're going through at home. You don't know what's going through with them at school. You don't know who's being bullied, who's getting abused. Like you don't know it. And to be able to, bring something positive to them, make it for that few minutes. They're the happiest kid on the planet. That has got to be rewarding. It is. It's everything. And, you know, I understand that not everyone's going to be able to buy a book and that's okay. So I always have either like free bookmarks or like free keychains, something that everyone can go home with. But I just hope that it's like the best hour of their life that they can say, I had the best day. Yeah, it looks like the next step has got to be finding some kind of national sponsor that can put something in that book where they can basically put set aside 10% of the books that you have that can go to the kids that can't buy the book um, and make it not embarrassing for that kid that doesn't have the money and kind of set that up with the teacher to take care of it on the backside there because there's just so many kids that this, they're never going to be able to buy a book. Right. And for the first three years, I literally gave away books and I, I, I love doing it. I'm like, well, you know, it's, it makes them so happy. Yeah. Well, also it has been an absolute pleasure having you on our show today. Uh, we learned a lot about an industry I did not know much about no. and uh, we love how you roll. Would you want to give a little plug in case people want to find out the products and things that you, that you put out there for us? Sure, sure. So if they want to head over to my website, alleycatseries.com, they can find me on Facebook and Instagram as well. Awesome. And where can we buy the books? Amazon, Barnes and where how do we get our hands on them? Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Target.com, and alleycatseries.com. Awesome. Wow. Well, again, appreciate your time. And uh, Julie, that was a good one. I'm yeah. Glenn Harper. Julie Smith. <laughs>